We'll turn with me again in God's Word to Second Chronicles chapter 5. And once again we're looking here at the Ark of the Covenant and how it is moved finally into the temple. This has been an odyssey really. Um, maybe you feel that we're working our way through the books of First and Second Chronicles. But right back in First Chronicles 13, David had been impressed that he must bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. God had revealed that this was the place where his people were to seek him. And so he sought to bring it up. He knew this was an important thing. But we remember in that chapter, he did it in the wrong way. Instead of having the Levites carry the Ark of the Covenant by poles, as they were meant to do, it was on the, on the cart, being pulled along, treated with contempt. And as the oxen stumbled, remember Uzzah put out his hand to steady the Ark, he considered that he was cleaner and purer and more holy than the dirt of the ground. But God had said no one was to touch it. And so Uzzah was struck down dead. And David, he, he struggled with that. He couldn't understand why God had done that. And we saw later, two chapters later, but some time later, David learned from his mistakes. We learn from this that good intentions are not enough. Good intentions are not enough. It's not enough to simply want to do the right thing. We have to do it in the right way. Uh, we can come up with a lot of good intentions. But if God has particularly set something down in his word as this is the way it should be done, our good intentions count for nothing. In fact, our good intentions would be an abomination to God if it's going against the way that he has prescribed. And particularly in those things that are closest to the heart of God, that is, in his worship. In his worship, he is particularly jealous over his worship. The second commandment teaches us about how we worship God. It shows us that if we worship God in a way that he has not prescribed, then it is idolatry. And the Lord our God is a jealous God. And he will visit sin. And so we're to be careful not to make images. We're not to, to make a way of worshipping according to our design. But to follow God's word. Good intentions may seem like a good idea at the time. But they're not enough. We have to follow God's word. And Solomon here, having built the temple. It's been a huge building project. And we saw the sizes of it last week. Um, having completed that, Solomon is now going to bring the Ark of the Covenant into its resting place. And he decides to follow carefully the example of David. He's going to learn from David's mistake. And, and, and we can see, we're not going to go through it in great detail, but he follows it exactly as God has intended. In verse 2, he assembles the leaders, the elders, the heads of the houses and so on. But not only does he assemble these leaders, what we could call the civil leaders, the leaders of tribes, but he also gathers all Israel. Verse 3. Solomon ties in the moving of the Ark of the Covenant into the temple with the Feast of Tabernacles. That's the feast that's spoken about here in verse 3. All the men of Israel assembled before the king at the feast that is in the seventh month. The Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths that was when Israel, uh, they built for themselves these makeshift structures out of palm branches and so on. And they dwelt in the open air. And I always think, since I was a child, this would have been the most exciting of the feast to go to. Because it's basically you're, you're camping out with your family in Jerusalem. You get to go and, and uh, sleep below the stars in a sense. It was at this feast, a time of great joy, remembering what God had done for them and bringing them through the wilderness. That Solomon brings the Ark of the Covenant into the house of God. We see that the Levites carry it properly on poles. We see that not only do they carry the Ark of the Covenant, but also the other vessels of gold and silver. All the things that had been in the tabernacle that had been used in the worship of God. And they are brought to their final resting place. Notice there in verse 6 that Solomon doing it follows the example of David with the sheer number of animal sacrifices. 
that are offered to God. It tells us there that they sacrificed so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. Get your mind around that for a moment. <laughs> Solomon lived at a time of great prosperity in the land, a, la a time of peace. The economy is booming. And, and since the economy is largely dependent upon the farmers, we can see that there are many sheep and oxen, many to spare, and many to be given up to the Lord as sacrifices. We saw last week that the altar that was built for the sacrifices was nine meters by nine meters. And I said to you that this building here is just a bit wider than nine meters. Um, so this is a huge altar. And so they could pile on many, many sheep and oxen in one go and burn them before the Lord. The altar was raised up four and a half meters, so it was more than double my height. And so as you came to that temple, if you were uh, not a priest, you were standing on the outside, you're watching, but you can see this huge structure, this altar, and it's burning in fire. Oh, these sacrifices are going up into heaven. And, and the writer of Chronicles here says that they couldn't be numbered. There was no one there counting beans, as it were. No one there counting the number of sheep and oxen and tallying it down. They couldn't do that. There were so many sacrifices offered to God that no one could keep up with counting them. It's a reminder to us, isn't it, of how bloody the Old Testament was. How much sacrifice there had to be. Hebrews 9 verse 22 tells us, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. We're thankful that we don't live in those days. What a sheer amount of work there would have to be. The smells, the sights. It wasn't always pleasant. But we live in the days of the gospel where Christ Jesus has come and he has given his own blood for the forgiveness of sins. We have the greater display of love in Jesus and his death on the cross. But in order for God to dwell in this temple, there had to be these sacrifices. Because God is a God who is holy, and his people are not holy. How can God come and dwell amongst a sinful people unless his wrath be satisfied? Unless he be appeased? Unless he be propitiated? Unless his wrath is turned away from us and laid on another? And that his love can be demonstrated freely to us. And that's why there were so many sacrifices. Because the nation was a great nation. Many people. But they were also great in sinning. Their sins were many. And that's true of you and me. Our sins are many. And sin is costly. Redemption is costly. And that's why we need Jesus Christ. Notice also that when... The Ark of the Covenant is brought in. We see verse 7 that it's placed underneath the wings of the cherubim. These cherubim we considered last week. Solomon had them made. Um, they were uh, cherubim or angels. There were two ch cherubim spanning. It was, again, it was nine meters in length. was the length of the most holy place. So a little bit. Uh, narrower than this building but not much each wing of the cherub was 2.25 meters so four wings next to each other spanned the whole width of the most holy place this was a huge structure that was built and the ark of the covenant small as it was comparatively sits between the cherubim this is God's throne on earth. This is where God's glory is. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. This is his seat of holiness. And this is his mercy seat. It tells us in verse 10. That there was nothing inside the ark. Except for the two tablets that Moses put there. At Horeb. Where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel. When they came out of Egypt. So there are these two tablets of stone. That is the Ten Commandments. 
Now, if I were to ask you Bible trivia, what articles were there inside uh, the Ark of the Covenant? I wonder what answer you would give. Would you say that? Just these two tablets of stone. Maybe you remember that Hebrews 9 verse 4 tells us that also in the Ark of the Covenant was the golden pot that had manna in it and also Aaron's rod that had budded. At various points in Israel's wilderness years, they were told, put this inside the Ark of the Covenant. So that the manna was what God had sent down from heaven, bread from heaven, angels' food it's sometimes called. Uh, And to remind them that God had been so gracious to them, they were to put a pot of it inside the Ark of the Covenant. Aaron's rod, which had budded. Remember at one point, uh, the Israelites were challenging Aaron's authority over the people of God. And uh, each tribe was to take, their leader was to have a, a staff and to set it there before the Lord. And the one that budded was the one the Lord had chosen. And it was Aaron's rod and only Aaron's rod which had budded. A dead stick started to produce life. And this was told uh, to be put inside the Ark of the Covenant. So is there a contradiction? Sometimes people are very quick to say this is a contradiction. But I don't think we need to see it that way. What we can say is that originally, uh, uh, under the leadership of Moses at that time period, there were three items inside the Ark of the Covenant. The golden pot with manna, Aaron's rod that had budded, And the two tablets of stone. But at this point. At this time. Solomon's time. The only thing that was inside there. Were the two tablets of stone. Now where the other things are. I can't tell you. I can't proclaim that. uh, Because the word of God does not make that clear to us. Perhaps they were set beside. The ark of the covenant. Rather than being inside it. Or perhaps during those years that the Philistines had taken the ark, perhaps they had sought to plunder these things and to take them away. We just simply do not know. But God's word is true. Hebrews 9 verse 22 tells us, sorry, Hebrews, that's not the right verse. Hebrews 9 verse 4 tells us that at one point these three things were inside the ark. But now at this stage, there is only one. But I want us to think just for a moment This one thing inside the ark, verse 10, there was nothing in the ark except the two tablets that Moses put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. What do these two tablets teach us? Well, these are the Ten Commandments. And because they were written in tablets of stone, It shows to us that these are permanent. The Ten Commandments were not designed simply for the Old Testament. They were not designed simply for a limited time period. And then they would pass away. But the Ten Commandments are permanent. They are lasting. They have authority in all ages. And in all nations. Every single culture is under the authority of the moral law expressed in the Ten Commandments. And even believers, although sometimes people say, I'm not under law, I'm under grace. We're going to consider that at our book study, God willing. So if you want to think more about what that verse really means, come to our book study. Even though believers sometimes say, I'm not under law, I'm under grace. Yet note here from verse 10, That these two tablets of stone are part of the covenant of grace. Because they are expressions of the covenant that God made with his people when he had delivered them out of Egypt. They are not part of the covenant he made with Adam. A covenant of works that is broken. Rather, these two tablets represent something in the covenant of grace. And notice the order is important. First, God delivers his people from Egypt. First, he redeems them from slavery. And then he gives them this law as the way of life, as a rule of life. And that simple lesson is this, friends. 
that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, saved by grace, delivered from bondage to sin, saved from Egypt, God expects you, God requires you, and God calls you to obey his Ten Commandments. You won't do it perfectly. That's true. We must repent of our sin and confess our sin. You won't do it perfectly. Nor can you merit anything with God by keeping these commandments. You can never earn anything with God. But God still calls you as an expression of your faith. As the fruit in keeping with your repentance. To follow each one of these ten commandments. He wrote them in stone. And we've got that phrase, don't we? We might say, we're planning to go Uh, For a picnic tomorrow, we're hoping to go to such and such a place, but it's not set in stone. In other words, we can change our plans. That's, That's maybe where we'd like to go, but it's not so fixed or so certain that we definitely must go to that place. But friends, here we have an expression of the covenant of grace, the law of God set in stone. There's no doubt about that. The finger of God himself wrote this in stone. And friends, even think a little bit more deeply about that. How can God have a finger? Anytime we read in the Old Testament about a visible display of God, who is it that appears? Who is it that makes the invisible God known? Is it not Jesus Christ? He is the image Of the invisible God. And so when we consider the finger of God. Writing in these stone tablets. We see the son of God. Wrote in these two tablets. The redeemer. The mediator. And so it's not right for us to say. That as Christians. Under Christ. We don't need to keep this law. Because as Christians under Christ. We remember that he has written these. In stone. For us. As believers to keep. We don't do it to earn anything, but we are to seek to follow these commandments to the glory of God. I was teaching at the Christian school this week, teach the secondary class, some of their Bible work, and we were talking about the Sabbath day. We were talking about how Jesus healed on the Sabbath day, and I was trying to make the point uh, that when Jesus' enemies criticized him for healing on the Sabbath day, It was not that Jesus was breaking the Sabbath, nor was it that Jesus was changing the meaning of the Sabbath day, that he was changing the law of the Sabbath, but rather Jesus was correcting the Pharisees' misunderstandings about the Sabbath day. Okay? That's what I was trying to teach. But it raised a bit of discussion in the class about whether that fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, whether it's still binding today. Um, Because many people in in other churches are taught that that commandment in particular, the Sabbath day commandment, is part of the Old Testament law and not part of the New Testament. And so people are taught in other churches, you don't need to do that. Don't worry about that. As long as you're finding time in your busy life to rest and relax, you're keeping the Sabbath day or you're keeping the principle of the Sabbath day. That's what many churches teach. Of course, they do give preference to the the Lord's Day because it's a time we gather together. If you can be here, you should be here. But if, if you can't, it's not that big of a deal. That's the general teaching on the Sabbath day in many churches. And this raised quite a lot of discussion in my class, more than I thought it was going to raise, but we entered into it anyway. And I went through with them all the Ten Commandments, holding up my fingers like this. Which of these Ten Commandments does not apply today? Are we allowed to worship different gods today? Are we allowed to worship and to make idols and graven images today? Are we allowed to abuse the name of God today? Uh, Skipping the fourth commandment for a moment, are we allowed to dishonor our father and mother today in the New Testament? Are we allowed to murder or hate? Are we allowed to commit adultery? Do we have free reign to sin So that grace may abide. Are we allowed to steal or lie or covet? Of course not. None of these commandments do we have liberty under the gospel to break. So why would anyone say we have liberty to break the fourth commandment? 
It's written in stone as part of the covenant of grace. It is the rule of life, the rule of obedience for believers. The law of God is good when it's used rightly. Don't believe people who say the law is bad, the gospel is good. The law is good and the gospel is good. They are both good. And the gospel enables us to keep the law. The gospel gives us not simply freedom from hell, but the gospel also gives us a desire to obey. If you love me, Jesus says, you will keep my commandments. And that applies to the fourth commandment, the Sabbath day, just as much as it applies to any other. If you love me, you will keep my day holy. The day Jesus rose from the dead. And so we should remember that these tablets of stone teach us this important lesson that God's law is set in stone for us today. If we move on in our study of this chapter, we see the next thing is when the, the priests come out, having placed the Ark of the Covenant inside the most holy place, it's now time for them to exit. And as they come out, we see that there are these various Levitical singers arranged according uh, to their divisions. They're wearing these, this glorious white linen. They're using cymbals and harps and lyres and trumpets standing to the east of that huge altar. And they're singing in unison to God. And we can see what they sing. And we'll think about that in a few moments. For he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. Now this chapter more, I think, than almost anywhere else, perhaps the only exception would be Psalm 150. This chapter is often used against churches like ours that don't use musical instruments in the worship of God. Why is it that here in our church we don't have harps and cymbals and lyres and trumpets. Why is it that in fact we refuse to have these things and say that it's wrong to have these things in the worship of God? Doesn't that go against the clear reading of this chapter? God's people were doing a good thing. They were doing it in the right way, in the way that God had commanded. Hadn't God commanded them to use these symbols, hearts, lyres and trumpets? Well, yes, he had. It was the commandment of David the king. We we see that later on in Chronicles. We'll come to it in due course. That all of this happened because David the king commanded it. And David was the one who arranged all the worship of God under the command of God. There was absolutely nothing wrong with what they did here in 2 Chronicles chapter 5. It was not morally wrong for the priests and the Levites to sing this word, which comes from the Psalms, to sing this praise to God with the accompaniment of all these trumpets and cymbals and so on. So why then do we not here in our church? I want to take a step backwards. In order to answer this question, should we have musical instruments in the worship of God today? Let's think about the whole thing for a moment. Should we have consecrated priests today? We see that in the chapter. I'm not a priest. I've told you this before. I'm a minister of the gospel. I'm not a priest. In fact, the Bible teaches us the priesthood of all believers. You're a royal priesthood, aren't you? That's what Peter tells us. A royal priesthood. You are all together serving God in purity. We don't have consecrated priests today like this chapter. We don't have devoted Levitical singers today, do we? There's no section of this church building that we fence off and saying, here the Levites will sing and they're the ones to sing a portion and we'll listen. No, the whole congregation joins together in unison. We're commanded that everyone with breath is to praise God. Should we require everyone to come to worship wearing fine linen? I wonder how you would feel about that if I said to you, 
I don't want you to come back here this evening unless you're wearing fine linen. It must be whiter than white. And you think to yourself, where am I going to get fine linen from? I don't know if any of my clothes is just made of fine linen. And if it is, is it white? Is that what God requires of us? Should we still have the Ark of the Covenant today? Should we still have the bronze altar, nine meters by nine meters, four and a half meters high? Should we, as verse 12 says here, should we stand east of the altar when we sing the praises with the instruments to God? As some churches stand and look to the east when they pray, Roman Catholics for certain parts of the Mass, uh, certain Orthodox Christians stand and look to the east in order to pray. The same, a similar sense in which Muslims pray towards Mecca. Is that what we should do following this chapter? You see, friends, I'm not being facetious here. But when people say to us, this chapter requires that we must use instruments in the worship of God. Or at least that this chapter gives us the, the opportunity or the freedom to use instruments in the worship of God. Does this chapter also require or give us the freedom to bring in the other ceremonies of the Old Testament law? If I were to say to you, tonight we're going to worship God at an altar, would you come or would you protest? Would you be like Jenny Geddes and throw a stool at me? The pews are fixed down. If I were to say to you, tonight we must be wearing linen and there are going to be priests doing certain things in the service. How would you feel about that? Surely there would be, those of you that understand the scriptures, surely there should be a repulsion at that idea. Because these things, it's not that they're simply Old Testament and we're living in the New Testament. They're part of the ceremonies that have been fulfilled by Christ. Jesus is our great high priest. Jesus is our altar and our sacrifice. Jesus is the one uh, who makes us the priesthood of all believers. All of this is fulfilled in Christ. And so the ceremonies are done away with. There's a reason why we don't use musical instruments in the worship of God. It's because we consider them to be part of the ceremonies of the Old Testament. You see, Psalm 150 commands the using of various instruments. And we know that passage commands these things. I, I hardly ever meet someone who disagrees with our position who will tell me that I'm sinning for not using instruments. They'll often say, we're not sinning because we use instruments. You, there's freedom to do it, but very few people will say, well, you're sinning by not using instruments. But if their understanding of the passage is such, they should say to us, you're actually breaking God's law by not using instruments. Because Psalm 150 commands these instruments. But very few people will say that. They make it a ma matter of conscience. Whether you use instruments or not, both are good. Both are fine. No, friends. Our position and the biblical position is this. The instruments are part of the ceremonies and they are fulfilled in Christ. The New Testament worship is simpler but more spiritual and more profound. And that is why we worship in the way we do. We see that in Ephesians 5. We thought about the passage uh, a few weeks ago, a few months ago maybe now. We sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs making melody in our hearts to God. Well, making melody in our hearts is plucking the strings of the heart to God. Instead of having priests and Levites using harps and lyres leading us in the worship to God, instead, you as God's people, as the priesthood of all believers, the royal priesthood of God, your heart must worship God. The strings of your heart must be engaged and plucked Every time you sing the Psalms, otherwise you're worshipping God with your lips and your hearts are parked somewhere else far from God. Friends, this position is not unique to the Reformed Presbyterian Church. Um, I, I've quoted Spurgeon on this before. Many of you know Charles Spurgeon, the greatest Baptist preacher in modern times. Spurgeon said this, 
instrumental music with its flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of noisemakers was no doubt well suited to the worship of the golden image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And harps and trumpets served well in the infant estate of the church under the law. But in the gospel's spiritual dominion, these may well be let go with all the other beggarly elements. See, there's someone who's very much not a Reformed Presbyterian. But on this point, we agree that these instruments belong to the ceremonial law. They are for the church in infancy. When you're talking to children, you give them a lot more pictures, don't you? You don't expect them to sit down with a big book with lots of words and that they'll understand that. You give them a picture book. Because then, with a few words, but with a picture that helps direct them to understand the story, they get more out of it, don't they? And God, in his wisdom, gave us picture books in the Old Testament. The ceremonies of the Old Testament. The instruments were all part of it. And because the priesthood has been fulfilled in Christ and the altar has been put away through the cross so too everything that accompanies it is put away these Old Testament ceremonies have no place in the New Testament church and so this chapter doesn't need to stump us when people come and bring it before us I, I, I went in that down that sort of rabbit hole because this is a real difficulty for people in the church. This is a passage that is constantly brought up and it appears on first reading that we are going against it. So it's important we understand our positions. But then let us see further, what is it that they sang on this day? Look at verse 13 and you see it. For he is good for his steadfast love endures forever they're singing to God and celebrating the goodness and the love of God we're going to sing this uh, at the end of the service uh, from Psalm 136 where this refrain comes 26 times 26 times to sing and praise that steadfast love of God which endures forever do you believe that friends do you see in your life Can you say God is good? Not merely that he's morally good and upright and righteous, which is true, but he is good to all who live. He's good especially to his people. And he has shown us steadfast covenant love. The banner's still up purely because it got broken and I couldn't get it down during the week. But we put on it about 200 years of God's faithfulness. Do you believe that? That God has been faithful to us here for over 200 years, that God is good to us here in Airdrie RP Church, and that we have so many reasons to give him praise. His love is so evident, friends, that it's remiss of us not to sing praise to him and not to thank him. Friends, do you celebrate who God is because of what he has done to us? He is loving. He is gracious. And he is merciful. And that steadfast love of God which endures forever is ultimately seen at the cross of Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There is love. Not that we loved God but that he loved us and that he gave his son as a propitiation for our sins. Do you want to understand love? Look at what Jesus did on the cross. And so friends, it's necessary for us to contemplate that. For us to reject Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross is for us to reject God's love. It's for us to reject his goodness. It's to say I want nothing to do with that loving God. Do you not see how that's shooting yourself in the foot? To say, the person who would show me the greatest love that could ever be given to me, I want nothing to do with them because I want nothing to do with Christ. I don't want a saviour. I don't want one to take away my sin from me. 
I don't want someone to wash me with his own blood. Friends, how foolish to hear the gospel and to reject it. To think that you're sufficient, that you're morally good enough in yourself to do without Jesus Christ. No, only God is good and his steadfast love endures forever. Christian brothers and sisters, can you look at your individual life through the ups and the downs that we face and can you say that he is good and that his steadfast love endures forever? I know, I can see it in your faces. It's one of the joys of preaching when I see things in your faces. I can see that you would say this and you do say it because you believe it. God has been good to you. And his steadfast love for you, Christian brother or sister, has endured forever. He never began loving you. He will never end loving you. His love will carry you through from your, uh, your first time when you believed right through to your dying breath. When you will go to heaven to be with your Savior. Our God is good. And then finally we see in this incident that we see the display of God's approbation his acceptance of what they've done and it's in the the last two verses at the end of verse 13 the house of the lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the lord filled the house of god if you know your bible you'll know that in exodus chapter 40 when the tabernacle was devoted to god that the same thing happened. Remember that the tabernacle was the forerunner of the temple. It was a tent. It was a temporary structure. But it symbolized all the same things. A a believing Israelite had the same access to the tabernacle as to the temple. The same things were taught there. There were priests and altars and an ark and incense and so on. All signifying redemption in Christ. But when the tabernacle was devoted to God, the cloud, that cloud which had led his people through the wilderness, the cloud which symbolized God's presence with them, it entered into the tabernacle and filled it. And so too here, the temple, much bigger than the tabernacle, even it cannot hold all the glory of God. The cloud fills it. And the priests who have been consecrated, who are wearing their fine linen, dare not go in to the holy place because God was there. They dare not go in. They could not stand before God to minister before him. For if the Lord God marks our iniquity, who can stand? In our communion season a few weeks ago, we thought of Isaiah in the throne room of God. And the seraphim who are around the throne and they're crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. We consider that glory of God, that beauty of God, evidenced primarily in his holiness. And so the the foundations shook before Isaiah. He was terrified and he cried out, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips dwelling amongst the people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the king. Isaiah was overcome with the glory of God. And it's the same thing here with these priests. They're overcome with it. They could not stand to minister. Who can abide the day of his coming? But friends, this year was all part of the Old Testament ceremonies. Because what we were taught in the Bible is that the temple is a type of Jesus Christ. And in Jesus Christ, the glory of the Lord has been revealed. Because a, a son has been born. A son has been given. The Lord Jesus Christ was God manifested in the flesh. The glory revealed. Because the glory of the Lord has tabernacled among men. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And he has come to do many things. 
to redeem us, to save us, to adopt us and all, all these things. But what has he come to do that relates to this? He has come to dwell in our hearts through faith. He has sent his spirit to dwell. That we, his people, are the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. Friends, if the priests could not stand to minister because of the intensity of this cloud that filled the temple, how can we dare go and dwell in tents of sin if the Holy Spirit dwells in us? Paul challenges the Corinthians, how can you go and unite yourselves to prostitutes when you're the temple of God? How can you go and engage in sin when you belong exclusively and wholly to the Lord, your Redeemer? Friends, this is a lesson to us that we must stay away from sin because the glory of the Lord has been revealed. And the glory of the Lord is within us, his people. Amen.